I'm Brianna, and this is Decoding Physiology, a series from Decoding DX where we focus on the pathophysiology of various clinical entities, because we believe that if you understand the why behind the diseases that we see, you'll have a more long-term understanding and be able to make better decisions for your patients. This is the last of a six-part series on metabolic alkalosis, and they all build on each other. So if you haven't seen parts one through five, please go back and watch them first. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the last branch of our giant metabolic alkalosis map. This video is gonna be on diuretic-induced alkalosis with specific focus on thiazide and loop diuretics. First, we're gonna go through some normal physiology. In the ascending loop of Henle, there's a really important ion pump called the NKCC transporter that takes one sodium, one potassium, and two chloride into the cell. This is powered by a sodium potassium pump on the other side of the cell, which also has associated chloride and potassium channels. Meanwhile, in the distal convoluted tubule, we have another really important pump called the sodium chloride co-transporter. As the name implies, it brings in both sodium and chloride together. This pump is powered by both a sodium potassium pump and a sodium calcium pump, which is also tied to a calcium channel. Now let's introduce some diuretics to the picture, starting with loop diuretics. Loop diuretics work by blocking that important NKCC pump that we talked about earlier. And thiazide diuretics work on the other big pump we talked about, the sodium chloride co-transporter in the distal convoluted tubule. The combined effect of both of these diuretics, which block these important transporters, results in there being a very high flow of sodium, water, and other solutes to the distal nephron. Now, we need to think about what kind of a state our overall body would be in, in the context of having loop diuretics and or thiazide diuretics on board. The whole point of having diuretics on board is to get rid of extra fluid. So the body is going to sense that and think that there is a overall low volume state we know that when there's a low volume state, it's going to trigger the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, ending up in the production of aldosterone. But at the same time, because of the diuretics effects in the loop of Henle in the distal convoluted tubule, we're going to have a high flow to the distal nephron. This is because of what we talked about in the last slide, where because the diuretics are blocking the important reabsorption channels, that means that we're going to have sodium and the associated water, along with the other electrolytes that it pulls, that are all going to end up in the distal nephron instead of being reabsorbed where they otherwise would have been. Now, hopefully this looks familiar. We have a high flow state to the distal nephron in combination of the presence of aldosterone. This means that aldosterone is going to be allowed to accentuate all the activities that we've already learned about. So we're gonna have more sodium reabsorption, more potassium excretion, and then importantly, in the intercalated cell, the aldosterone is going to also increase the creation of free hydrogen bicarb for the bicarb to be absorbed into the blood and the hydrogen to be pumped into the lumen to be excreted. Again, this is new production of bicarb. This is not filtered reabsorbed bicarb. This is de novo bicarb. So in the state of high flow to the distal nephron in the presence of aldosterone, the end effect is that we're going to have a high amount of extra bicarbonate that's created and sent into the blood without paired hydrogen with it to neutralize it. And then as always, we have to have paired processes going on to help maintain the alkalosis. We talked about earlier, the reason why the aldosterone is active in the first place is because the body senses a lower volume state. When there's volume contraction, we already talked about this, we can lose extra volume without changing the solutes, which will lead to an increased concentration of that solute. When we're talking about bicarbonate, this means alkalosis. We're also going to have the proximal convoluted tubule reabsorbing the bicarbonate, again, because the body thinks that we're in a lower volume state because of the diuresis. We're also gonna have the hypokalemia effects like we've talked about already in the previous videos. The aldosterone triggers the extra reabsorption of sodium, meaning the extra negative charge in the lumen, meaning the extra attraction of potassium out of the cell into the lumen to be excreted. This leads to a hypokalemia, which will trigger the compensatory mechanisms that we've already talked about, with potassium being pumped out into the blood and hydrogen being transferred into the cells, leading to a lower overall concentration of hydrogen, 
which contributes to the alkalosis. We're also going to have the intermittent excess production of bicarb in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. We know that the presence of aldosterone in the distal nephron will produce this effect. And the aldosterone will be triggered on an intermittent basis because of the diuretics. The diuretics will reach a certain peak state where they'll have maximum effect and then their concentrations will decrease. And that might increase again if the patient takes another dose. So we'll have this intermittent up and down effect of the aldosterone. So this brings us back to our big, giant, scary map. Hopefully this makes a lot more sense now and is quite a bit less intimidating. In reality, it breaks down to two big steps. Step one, figure out what is creating the alkalosis. Are you eliminating acid without eliminating bicarb? Is there some source of exogenous bicarbonate or bicarbonate precursors being added to the patient? Or is there something creating a high flow state to the distal nephron while also allowing there to be aldosterone being active? And then step two, what is happening that is maintaining the alkalosis? Is there a continuous process going on that's creating the alkalosis without a break, without letting the body compensate? Is there volume contraction leading to a relative increase in the concentration of bicarbonate and an increased reabsorption of bicarb in the proximal convoluted tubule? Is there hypokalemic compensation going on? Or does the patient have a GFR below 40, meaning that they're simply not able to get rid of the extra bicarb that's being created by the process in step one? Here are our references. Thank you so much for joining us. If you've made it this far, I commend you. That was such a long series with some pretty complicated renal phys. Hopefully this video series has helped to demystify the pathophysiology of metabolic alkalosis so that you can more easily recognize it in your patients, figure out what's causing it and maintaining it, and do things to address it so that we can have better outcomes for our patients.